Hey, welcome back Academic Astronomy for our final video segment of the school year. And I'm mostly coming today to sophomores and juniors as senior grades have been turned in. But seniors, anybody following along who would like to plot out this section of sky as well, that would be great. Today we're talking about a sky that is rarely seen, at least here from Altoona, Pennsylvania. This, everybody, is going to be our south circumpolar sky. And it's going to be on the rarely seen SC003 and SC003T charts. So we weren't in school to get these, so I've posted PDFs on Google Classroom. You can print both of them out at home. Shouldn't take a lot of printer ink, just two small pages here. So to show you where this fits into perspective, everybody, just recall our SC01 chart. And the ends of this chart connect together like a tube. So we've already had the SC002 chart, which would be up here on the top to form like a top hat. That's the top of our night sky. And now the SC003 will be around the bottom of it right there. So that's where our final piece of sky is. So we don't do this in semester astronomy because you can't actually see it here from northern latitudes. But for all of us in the full year course, this is our final piece of the nighttime sky. I've also posted your vocabulary list on Google Classroom, which you'll use to plot. So the issue here, everybody, the south circumpolar sky is almost too much of a good thing. In the northern hemisphere, particularly in the spring and fall skies, when we're looking away from the plane of the Milky Way, we don't have many bright stars. Here, though, we're looking right down the barrel of the Milky Way, which runs right through the south circumpolar sky. So there's actually so many bright stars that rather than a handful of very large distinctive constellations, we have this mess that you see here of countless teeny tiny ones. Because explorers from the Northern Hemisphere took additional centuries to actually explore the Southern Hemisphere in detail, that's where we ended up having explorers like Cortez and Pizarro and Magellan, a lot of these constellations down here don't end up having the long-term mythologies and history of the Northern Hemisphere. Many are named after birds, and some were actually added in modern times to fill in missing pieces of the sky, and they're named after pieces of scientific equipment. That's why you get constellations like Microscopium and Telescopium right there. Some of these are a little bit lame even though obviously microscopes and telescopes are awesome. So let's start taking a trip through the south circumpolar sky, and I'll take you through step by step what you need to have on your charts. So first let's talk about the easier chart, the SC003. This is what you're gonna be plotting in academic astronomy. Now just for a quick reference point and a little bit of history, notice teens, unlike us having a North Star Polaris, they do not actually have a south star over their end of the axis. And some astronomers and anthropologists believe that this actually affected the development of civilization. Here in the northern hemisphere, navigation is fairly easy for ship captains because we have that one fixed reference point on the sky. But here in the southern hemisphere, the entire sky was moving. And so their navigation had to be more complex and so it took a longer amount of time for seafarers to be able to traverse these distances. So neat little bit of history there. All right, let's begin with one repeat that we have from the SC001 charts. You might recall this down at the feet of Orion the Hunter in the wintertime sky. Please plot Eradnus. This meandering constellation with oxbow shapes was the river or basically the river of the dead, which in Greek and Roman mythology separated the realm of the living from the realm of those in the beyond. So once again, we see the other end of Eradnus featuring a bright star at his headwaters named Akernar. These next three constellations somewhat go together to form one large mythology. 
We have three pieces of a ship. We have Karina, the keel, and that's K-E-E-L. A keel usually refers to the long longitudinal fin on the bottom of the ship to keep the hull upright in the water. It is also home to the second brightest star in the whole night sky called Canopus. So Sirius, which we know is first from Canis Major, Canopus is second. We then have Vela, the sail of the ship. So here would be the keel of the ship, the sail above it. And then maybe the best mythology on the whole sky, even better than Capricornus, the sea goat in the skies of fall, we have Pupus, the poop deck. Yes, you heard it right, the poop deck. Now, poop deck in sailing terms didn't refer to the part of the ship where the sailors would actually lean off the side to go to the bathroom. It actually refers to the high, smaller deck where the captain's wheel would be. So that's Pupus, the poop deck, Vela, the sail, and Karina, the keel. Next up, perhaps the only constellation down in the southern sky that is fairly large and actually looks somewhat like its namesake. We have Centaurus, the centaur. Now you might recall from the summertime sky, we did learn Sagittarius the archer, but I was a real stickler about saying you cannot call him the centaur. You have to call him the archer. There you can see the bottom of his teapot shape. So there's Sagittarius the archer. And the reason we have to call him the archer is because Centaurus is actually the centaur. And he has a number of very bright stars like, oh look, Bayer system, there's the Greek letter Alpha, Alpha Centauri. Wait a minute, we know Alpha Centauri. This represents a triple star system, and that's the next closest star system to our own sun, only between four and a half and five light years away. Yet, to the naked eye, it still looks like a single point of light on the sky. And right next door, not to be confused with Alpha Centauri B, because recall, that is a double star system with the dim star Proxima then orbiting near them. This is Alpha Centauri, or I'm sorry, this is, Cen yeah, Alpha Cent, nuts, Beta Centauri. There we are, even I mixed up. So there is the little Greek symbol Beta. This is Beta Centauri, also known as Hadar. One new object that I'm adding this year, it's a stunning naked eye object if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. It's right here. This is called Omega Centauri. It's a globular star cluster whose angular diameter is as big as the full moon. Next up, probably the most famous constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. This is Crooks or the Southern Cross. There have been songs about it. There's beautiful astrophotographs. Not only do we have three bright stars of different spectral classes, we have A Crooks, we have Gay Crooks, we'll learn that on the T-chart, and Mimosa, but you can actually use Crooks. We learned this back in the section on night sky navigation. If you were ever lost in the Southern Hemisphere, check it out. If you draw a line through gay crooks, through eight crooks, and then you go about four cross lengths, it will actually give you the ballpark location of the SCP point on the sky. So know that in case you ever get lost in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, our final four constellations are all bird-based. Next up, we have what looks like a curved little version right there of Delphinus the dolphin. This one is called Musca. In mythology, it is a fly. And for fun, I always like to say this one with a pretend Russian accent. This is Musca. So it's Musca the fly. Let's then return up near the headwaters of Eradnus the river. Right next door, we have a constellation called Phoenix. And in mythology, you guessed it, it is a phoenix, so a fire bird that once it got so old would catch on fire and then a new bird would rise from the ashes. That symbolism is used by different cultures around the world to express the belief in an afterlife or reincarnation. That's phoenix, the phoenix. Then, this to me, usually there's a dimmer star pictured here. This almost looks like a curved version of Cygnus the swan. This is Grus. And like Cygnus, it is also a bird, but this is a crane, C-R-A-N-E, a, -E, a long-necked water bird. So we have Phoenix the Phoenix, and we have Grus the Crane. 
Our final flying constellation is right here. It's Pavo or Pavo. This one is the Peacock. And we're going to see on the T-chart, there's a pretty blue star here. It's Alpha Star. This is known as the Peacock Star. Okay, before we shift to our T-charts, everybody, get a good look. Here's what you should have on your printed out SC003. We should begin with Eratinus the River, then add the three parts of the sailing ship. Carina, the keel, Vela, the sail, and Pupus, the poop deck. Over here, we have Centaurus, the centaur, and then wrapped between his legs, very famous constellation, Crooks, the cross, and then our flying constellations. Musca, the fly, Phoenix, the phoenix, Gross, the crane, and Pavo, the peacock. All right. So let's go ahead and now shift over to the more challenging chart, the SC003T. So here's what yours looks like when you print it out, and then voila! I've got our fancier version that you'll need for your final grade of the school year. So let's take a look at it. The Bayer names are important here because not all the star names that are listed on the star charts are actually listed by their actual name. So you're going to need to find the Bayer name. So Akronar we mentioned on the previous chart. But then if you all look at your vocab list, which let me give you an example. I got it right here. Okay, Akamar. So Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and then Eradnose. That's just the Latin possessive of Eradnose the River. So long story short, look for the Epsilon symbol in Eradnus, and then that is going to be Akamar. So if we look over here, do, 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 there's the, oh, geez, I'm messing up. I said Epsilon, that's a Theta. This is what you get when you do one take. Sorry, guys, messing up my Greek letters. That's Theta. Okay, so then our Theta symbol is right there. So Akamar is Theta Eradnase, and so you're going to put that right there at the bend of the river. So we've got Eradnus, we've got Akronar, and we've got Akamar. Heading down here in Carina, please do plot the second brightest star in the night sky. This past year, I was lucky enough to go down to the Caribbean for a couple days for a wedding, and I actually got to see Canopus and Sirius in the sky at the same time. It was utterly insane. It was so awesome. So that's the second brightest star in the night sky. Ooh, sorry, my fingernail's dirty. I've been doing some gardening outside. Sorry about that. And then right here, this one is going to be Avior. So there's where I was thinking Epsilon. Epsilon Carina A. So just think Carina. Look for the Epsilon star, the fifth brightest star. You see it right there. So then over here on the T-charts, that is Avior. So then Vela the Sail and Pupus the Poop Deck don't have any bright stars. Okay, over here to Centaurus, we've got the Alpha Star, Alpha Centauri. That would be Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri, all contained in that one bright dot, the next closest star system to us. Here is Beta Centauri. I messed that up earlier. This one is called Hadar. Silly way I remember that. I think Hadar is going to hate. That's how I remember Hadar. Then right here is that beautiful naked eye star cluster called Omega Centauri. Up in Crooks, it's a little constellation, but three of the four stars have proper names. We've got A. Crooks, the Alpha Star, Mimosa, the Beta Star, and then the Gamma Star is called Gay Crooks. So just look for the Gamma symbol. So Gamma Crooksy in the Bayer system, that's that one right there. Over here, we're going to label that one Gay Crooks. There's Muska. Here is Phoenix again. And then here in Pavo, oh, oh man, I forgot to plot Gross. I just realized it. it's going to be right there. Okay, don't do what Mr. Krug did. Make sure you add Gross as well because I just forgot that and I just realized it now. All right, here in Pavo or Pavo, its alpha star is called the Peacock Star. And it's called that, think back to your spectral classes, O-B-A-F-G-K-M, O-B, a fine girl, guy, kiss me. It's a B star, so it's a hot, pretty blue star. It's one of the most beautiful blue stars on the sky, so it's named after Peacock Blue. So I like to think of this as like the body of the peacock. Maybe the peacock star is its head, and then these are the beautiful tail feathers right there. Finally, what I didn't mention, 
We also have the two closest galaxies to our own Milky Way, although recent studies show that the Milky Way may actually be cannibalizing an even smaller galaxy as we speak. So right here, both naked eye visible, this is the small Magellanic Cloud, or the SMC. Then here we have the large Magellanic Cloud, or the LMC. Named after the European explorer Magellan, who was the first European of note to observe them while he was circumnavigating the Earth. So I like to call these the SMC and the LMC. All right, let's take a look. Here is how your SC001T chart should look. And unlike Mr. Krug, don't forget, do add in Gross the Crane as well. Okay, these are going to be your final two grades for the astronomy class. So the SC003 will be the first 10-point grade. Then the SC003T will be the second one. All right, for Mr. Krug, it's been awesome having you guys as students this year. Get this plot done and get it posted. Peace.